in the field of genetics, today we have come to know that it is the sperm which is responsible for determining the sex of the child. And today science tells us that the 23rd pair of chromosomes in the human being, it determines the sex of the child. If it's XX, it's a female. If it's XY, then it's a male. So it is the sperm which is responsible for determining the sex. If the X of the sperm takes part in the fertilization, then a female is born. If the Y takes part, then a male is born. And this is exactly what the Quran says in Surah Najm, chapter number 53 verse number 45 and 46, that we have created the human being from minute quantity of liquid which is ejaculated. Minute quantity of liquid, ejaculated means it has to be a male fluid. The similar message is repeated in Surah Qiyamah, chapter number 75, verse number 37 to 39, that we have created the human being from a minute quantity of sperm. Not for the min maniyumna. We have created the human being from minute quantity of sperm, then made it into an alaka, then made the alaka into mudga, then gave it sex, male and female. So the Quran says that the sperm is responsible for the sex of the child, whether it's male or female. In this country of us, this great country, India, for reasons known best to the Indians, in India mainly, most of the people, they prefer having sons rather than daughters. And if a lady gives birth to a daughter, very often the mother-in-law, she will blame the daughter-in-law. That why did you give birth to a daughter? According to the science and the Quran, if the mother-in-law has to blame anyone, she should not blame the daughter-in-law, she should blame the son. Because it is the male fluid which is responsible for discipline the sex of the child, male or female. Actually, it's in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He is the one who makes it male or female. But if the mother in law has to blame anyone, she should blame the son. Because he is responsible for the sex of the child, male or female. The Quran says in Surah Az-Zumur, chapter 39, verse number 6, that we have made the human beings in stages, one after the other, in three waves of darkness. According to Prophet Keith Moore, he said that this verse of the Quran, when it mentions the three waves of darkness, it refers to the anterior abdominal wall, the uterine wall, and the amniocorionic membrane. That the human being is made into stages in three waves of darkness. The Quran describes the various embryological stages in great detail. The Quran mentions in Surah Mu'minun, chapter number 23, verse number 12 to 14, that we have created the human being from a quintessence of clay, then made it into a nutfa, a minute quantity of liquid, then made the nutfa into alaka, a leech-like substance, then made the alaka into mudga, that's a chewed-like lump, then made the mudga into ezama, bones, then clothed the bones with lahem, that is flesh, and then we made a different creature. Glory be to Allah, who's the best to create. These three verses of the Quran describe the various embryological stages, the initial stages of development of a human being in the mother's womb in great detail. First it says that we made it from a nutfa, which we discussed, a minute quantity of liquid. Then made the nutfa into alaka. That means a leech-like substance, which we discussed earlier. The meaning of the Arabic word alaka, it has got three meanings. One is a leech-like substance. It also means something which clings. And the third meaning of alaka is congealed clot of blood. Besides it looking like a leech, the embryo in the initial stages, it also behaves like a leech. It behaves like a blood sucker. It derives its nutrition from the mother through the placenta. It behaves like a blood sucker. So besides looking like a leech, it also behaves like a leech. The second meaning, something which clings, we know that the embryo clings to the uterine wall. Throughout the nine months that the fetus is in the womb of the mother, it clings to the uterine wall. The third meaning of alaka is congealed clot of blood. And today's science tells us that in the initial stages, 
the blood does not circulate. And the blood clots in the vessels, and it appears like a congealed clot of blood. So all three meanings of Allah alhamdulillah today's sign says is in perfect conformity to latest advances made in embryology. It further says we placed it in a karar -e makin a place of security. And we know today that the fetus is protected posteriorly by the spinal column, that the backbone, as well as the posterior muscles. And anteriorly, it is protected by the anterior abdominal wall, by the amniocardionic membrane, as well as the amniotic fluid, which protects the child. So the science today testifies that the child is well protected in the womb of the mother. It further says we made the alaka into a mudga. A mudga means a chewed like lump. So Professor Keith Moore took a plaster seal and made it look into a leech like substance, initial stage of embryo, and then placed it between his teeth. He bit it to make it appear like a mudga, a chewed like lump. And when he saw it, the teeth marks, it resembled the so mites from where the nerves develop. And the Quran continues, we made the mudga into izama bones, then clothed the bones with lahem, that is flesh. Then we made it altogether a different creature. So what does the Quran mean that we made it into altogether different creature? Till this stage of mudga, izama, lahem, chewed like lamb, bones, flesh, till this stage, today science tells us, the initial stages of development of a human being is similar to the development of a fish, rabbit, and many other animals. Only after this stage does the human development differ in looks, where we have a head, then we have limbs. Then the Quran says, we made it into a different creature. Glory be to Allah, who is the best to create. Imagine, the Quran describes the various embryological stages in great detail. And Professor Keith Moore, he said that this description given in the Quran, based on shapes, alaka, leech-like substance, mudga, chewed like lamb, izama, bones, laham, flesh, is far superior to the divisions made in modern embryology, where we say stage one, stage two, stage three, stage four, it's difficult to identify. The description given in the Quran is far more superior and much more easy. And previously the scientist, they thought, it was in the 16th and 17th century, when scientists like Swamadam, they thought that the sperm contained the miniature human being. The head of the sperm contained the miniature human being and then it grew in the womb of the mother. Later on, when they came to know that the size of the ovum is bigger than the sperm, D. Graffe, he said that the human being is present in the ovum and not the sperm. Later on in 18th century, Mao Paratis, he propounded the biparental theory that both the ovum and the sperm is responsible for the creation of the human being. They fertilize, they form the zygote, which the Quran has described in great detail. Furthermore, the Quran says in Surah Hajj, chapter number 22, verse number 5, that we have created the human beings from a minute quantity of clay, made into alaka, made the alaka into mudga, partly formed and partly unformed. This verse of the Quran was taken to Dr. Marshall Johnson, who is the head of the Department of Anatomy in Daniel Institute, in Sir Thomas Jefferson University in USA, in Philadelphia. Now we have come to know in science that if at this stage we cut the embryo and we analyze the organs, we find some of the organs are formed, some are not formed. So Professor Marshall Johnson said, if we describe this stage of the embryo as a complete creation, it will be wrong because some organs are not formed. If we label it as an incomplete creation, that's also wrong because some of the organs are formed. So there's no better description than the description mentioned in the Quran, partly formed and partly unformed. In Arabic, it can also be treated as differentiated and undifferentiated. And Professor Marshall Johnson said that at this stage, some cells are differentiated, some are undifferentiated. Further is mentioned in the Quran, in Surah Sajda, chapter number 32. Verse number nine, that we have given the human beings the faculty of hearing and sight. It's mentioned in Surah Insan, 
chapter number 76, verse number 2. We have given to the human being the gift of hearing, sight, and feeling. But the Quran first speaks about hearing, then it speaks about sight. And today science tells us the first sense to develop in a human being is the sense of hearing. By the 22nd day, the ear starts to formulate. And by the fifth month of pregnancy, it is completed. And later on, the eye splits open. That's in the seventh month of pregnancy. So the Quran is perfect in conformity with science. First come the sense of hearing, then come the sense of sight. There was an experiment done where a baby whose mother was a typist, a newborn baby was taken, and the mother of that baby was a typist, and that baby born to a typist was placed along with other nine babies who were born to normal mothers who were not typists. And the typewriter was sounded. All the babies were scared except the baby of the typist, because the baby of the typist was used to hearing the typewriter in the womb of the mother. So the baby was used to it, so he wasn't scared. You know, there are many hadiths which say that the pregnant woman should read the Quran. Today, science has confirmed that when the mother is pregnant, when the lady is pregnant, what she sees, what she hears, what she listens has an impact on the child. 